Are you ready to dive into teacher life with me? I hope you're ready because you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. Do you like my lipstick today? We're talking about China. I'm feeling a little red. know me, my name is Alexa Baroda. For a little over a month now, I've been teaching high school English, 11th grade. Prior to that, I taught middle school language arts for seven years. And prior to that, I was teaching in China. Are you ready? Let's go. One, why did I do it? I'm always asked that question. How did I do it? With little to no money or resources. For teaching, <laughs> what that was like. I didn't speak Chinese. They didn't speak English. So how does that work? Okay, I'm gonna talk about that. And then lastly, I'm just gonna leave you with five really quick tips. If you are interested in teaching in China, pay attention to my tips. I wish someone told me. While I was in China, I blogged a lot, okay? I love, writing was my saving grace. And I recently have just read through all of my blogs to kind of prep for this video a little bit. And whew, I could not possibly share all the stories that I would like to share with you because this would be a very long video. But you know, if you're really thinking about teaching in China, please take a look at my blog and read some of my teaching stories. They are real, they are raw. I leave nothing out. I will share what made some. me go to China. Well, a year prior, I had the travel bug, if that's what you want to call it, and I signed up for this program called Cross Cultural Solutions. Look into that if you'd like to volunteer teach with a group. So I did that in Costa Rica for two weeks and I absolutely loved it. I loved it so much that I looked into paying teacher jobs. And at the time, I was president of an education club at my college called Education Connections. And that's exactly what it was connections. So I started using those connections and reaching out and vocalizing the fact that I was super interested in getting a paid overseas teaching position, just teaching English and particularly in Asia. So over time, just when I thought that they had nothing for me over time, they gave me something on China. And I, the moment that I went on the Jesse website, which I will talk to you about in a moment, I couldn't get off. I couldn't stop. And I just knew in that moment that I was going to China. Jesse is the name of an agency who hires teachers and places them in international schools throughout Nanjing and some other areas in the Jiangsu province as well. I decided to go through them. Now at the end of my video, I want to talk about the difference between being hired at a school with the school or through an agency. Now, in retrospect, I'm kind of glad that I went ahead and went through with an agency because I put safety first and foremost. I put that at the forefront of what I was doing. And because it was an agency and I had someone there acting as a middleman, I just felt a lot more secure in the decisions that I was making. And I will leave it at that. But there are pros and cons to working with an agency, which I'll get on later. So I go on the website, I look at the requirements and I say, darn, I don't meet the requirements. You need a certain amount of experience, a TESOL certification, which I immediately looked into getting uh, because I really wanted to do this. Well, I applied anyway, and it turns out that I got it. And I went through all the steps, you know, getting your visa, asking all the questions. I literally graduated college and a month later I was out. The most expensive part is the flight cost. And I didn't have that. I sold my car. I sold my baby. Sometimes we have to sell our life to get where we want to go. I was reimbursed for everything that they told me they would reimburse me for. It happens right at the very end. So that requires some trust. Was I nervous? Strangely, no, I wasn't. And I'm not even kidding. I was more excited than anything. I wanted all of those feelings that I had when I was teaching in Costa Rica. But I Here's when the nerves came and they came with a vengeance. I seriously think that I experienced my very first panic attack in my life on the plane. When I got on that plane, something happened to me. Like I was locked into this decision that I really just never completely wrapped my head around. China Airlines freaked me out. I felt like I was flying to China on a toy. I was freaking 
New Jersey girl, 25 years old, gets off the plane, gets into the airport. The culture shock was sinking in. And a lot of what I'm about to talk about in my teaching came from the culture shock that I was in that nobody can prepare you for. Nobody can tell you, oh, follow these steps and avoid, avoid culture shock. No. Okay, fast forward, because I'm not here to talk to you about life in China, okay? That is another video. Let's stick to teaching. One name for you, Val. He was the man. If you are an ESL teacher, you follow Val's YouTube channel right now. I just learned he had a YouTube channel maybe a month ago, and he's so good. He's smart. He's kind. He's helpful. He speaks Chinese. He understands the culture. He saved me when I got there whether he realized it or not. He was the only person who I found true comfort in, in that if I needed something or if you know anything went wrong, like I could go to this man and I would be okay. It is so important that we have someone like that making this type of decision. You know what I mean? This agency, Jesse, they help set you up with a Chinese cell phone. They take you to the bank. They help you, um, you know, with your medical insurance and all that. Now through this agency, Jesse, I taught one first grade class, two second grade classes, as well as I had an after school program that I taught, I tutored. And then I went to someone's house and I tutored these two adorable twin girls and their brother. But then I did, I had a couple side gigs that I had done on my own. One of the nice things about working for an agency is you're not putting in full days. I only worked 20 hours a week, but I didn't get paid as much as you know, if I was hired directly by a school. I felt that um, it still worked out though in that all the tutoring jobs that I took didn't really seem to make a difference. I didn't mind my setup at all. The hours were great. I worked 20 hours a week. Top international school that you could attend in all of Nanjing. That's where they put me. And apparently it's not easy to teach there. Well, I saw this place. I'm going to go ahead and share some of these pictures with you in this really, cute book of the school that I taught at. I kept it as a keepsake. This school, I've never seen anything like this. I just felt so honored to be at this school. Okay, so overall, it was such a great experience. I thought I was going to go back. I came home with the idea that I was going right back once I renewed my visa. So don't get me wrong in any of these stories that I, that I give you. I loved it. Even though it was very hard for me in the beginning, it lightened up quite a bit and it ended up just coming very naturally to me. But my first couple of weeks, my first two months, my first two months were brutal. Depending on the classroom that I was in, I had anywhere from 20 to 40 students, depending on the classroom that I was in. One was not the same. I taught these books, we called them LWE books. First and second graders would not stop touching my butt in more than one school. They wouldn't stop touching my butt. I would just walk around the room and they were poking me. They were poking me in the butt. I did all the things. I spoke nicely to them. I tried to reason with them the best way that I could. I tried to talk to a translator to talk to them. The translator looked at me like I had 10 heads. Everyone looked at me like I had 10 heads. So I'm like, okay, so this is uncommon. They're just touching my butt then. They also love to grab my mole. They would just reach out and grab it, like try to peel it off. All of the things that I tried didn't work. It wasn't until one day I practically yelled at them. Like no smiling, no laughing, told them how awful what they did was and that I was gonna tell their parents and then they never did it again. Now I am so new to teaching, right? So new. And I would have the principal, the vice principal, principals from other schools, other teachers, parents, just sitting by the windowsill, we had these big open windows, just taking pictures. I cannot tell you how many times I had my picture taken or you know, somebody would have notebooks out and they're just taking notes. I was observed more than I was not observed. And I wasn't mentally prepared for that. Nobody warned me that that would happen. And it made me feel awkward. They told me that I would have a translator. It was in the contract that I signed. It was told to me during my training. Here's the thing. I had a translator who spoke zero English. She couldn't translate anything for me. She spoke no English. She couldn't translate a thing. Here's what she was good at. She was good at keeping them in line in terms of behavior. She was good at that, but, but then she just wasn't even there. I wanna get this one story out and it was my worst day. 
I was so tired and I was going through the culture shock and I was just all these things and it was my third day teaching. I knew that Val was coming and I told you how much I like Val and I value Val so that was not a problem. I knew he was coming in to observe me. He came in, now this is my third day and this is in the really nice school. He comes in, the principal is in, her name was Madame Gu, and she was so cute. Another principal from a different school came in, a male teacher, I don't remember his name was in, Amy, who I'm collaborating with, she was in, a parent was in. They all just lined up like a panel, sit down with notepads and start taking my picture while I'm teaching, and I wasn't expecting it. I was having a panic attack right in front of them, and nobody did anything about it. I couldn't think, I couldn't function, I couldn't get the technology to work. I, I, would, I, I, I would call the kids by their team numbers over and over again each day. I couldn't even remember their team numbers and there were only four. I kept getting them mixed up. The kids were yelling at me because I was calling them the wrong names. I was, I was awarding points to the wrong teams because I was so flustered and I was sweating. And I have never, fallen so short under pressure before. It was so terrible that when class ended, I expected the kids to just get up and leave. Okay, the bell rang, they did their eye exercises, I expected them to just leave. And I, 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 was, I was holding back tears is what I was doing. So I wait for them to leave and I'm just looking down, I'm, I'm getting all my stuff together, getting ready to leave, to run out of there. And I just hear Val go, um, are you going to close your class? And I look up and they're waiting for me. Even though the bell rang, they're waiting for me. They were waiting for me to say bye to them. I said bye, embarrassed that they were all just sitting there watching me and I didn't even know because I'm in the middle of a panic attack. Who knows how long they were staring at me for? Is she gonna close class? So I'm like, bye kids, bye, bye. When they were out, I was out right behind them. And I, I can't believe I did this. I looked at all of these people like I gave the hardest eye roll of my life and it was so obvious and I didn't care because I was offended that they watched me go through that. Feeling like a total failure, I had to meet up with Val shortly afterwards for, I guess, you know, constructive criticism, which he wouldn't give me. He told me that I had had a day and that he would tell me later and he just kind of listened and Ooh, talk about doing the ugly cry. I just kind of let it all out to him and I was really embarrassed and I was so embarrassed to see him the next day. I was embarrassed to see the staff at the school. I was embarrassed to see my student because I was just mortified. I was mortified, I was mortified, I was mortified. I, I can't even tell the story. If you're wondering why they're doing that, they thought that I had the answers. So they're in the middle of trying to change the way that teachers deliver lessons. And I think that they thought that I was going to do something magical. Their students excel in all content areas except for speaking English. And they couldn't seem to figure out why other schools were performing higher than theirs. So they kind of saw me as, you know, a way in, a way to get those student scores up. And I think that they thought that I was just going to perform magic in the classroom. Oftentimes after my school days at this particular school, I would have to attend a meeting. I enjoyed the meetings. I enjoyed bouncing ideas back and forth on how we could get their scores up, how I could best teach them English. I felt very heard. I felt valued. I enjoyed the meetings, but they were also pretty comical because every single meeting involved a lot of pictures. <laughs> it's nice to have the pictures now because when I look at them, you know, all those memories come back, but I mean, half of it was just a photo op, if I'm being honest. I'm being serious, like everybody wanted photos with the blonde haired, blue eyed American girl. You're Meg Warren, you're Meg Warren, you're Meg Warren, like, oh my God. Little kids are already funny in that and how honest they are and they don't really hold back. So when I'm in the classroom with them, my students, like they would just get so close to my face just to stare into my eyeball and they would touch my hair and they would ask me like what color my hair is. They just always wanted to like rub their hands on my skin. I felt like an alien. <laughs> I felt like an alien in there. They were just 
fascinated with what I looked like. Hello lovely folks and welcome to my car. I had to stop filming yesterday because I had to go, I had to run. And today it is raining. I have a few extra minutes on my hands and I was thirsty. So I thought I would just kind of pull over and randomly pick up where I left off about China because that's how I do. If you're wondering what I'm drinking, it is a pistachio latte from Starbucks. I don't go to Starbucks very often. I get all excited when I talk about teaching in China, so I thought I would treat myself. It was $5.60. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I am so cheap. If you notice that my chest is a little bit red, it is because I went tanning. I don't know why I do this to myself. And a little fun fact about China, the fairer skin you have, the better. Yeah, they'll like walk around with umbrellas over their head. You'll see that in their lotions and soaps, it'll say it includes bleach like to make their skin even whiter than it already is. I want to talk about what it was like with my co-teacher. I need to say something about her because if you ever want to teach in China, this could happen to you. It also just says ish loads about being American. Amy, who I adore, I did, I adored her. She is one of my favorite relationships in China. I, after working a few days, weeks, I don't even remember, alone, I was told that her and I are gonna start sharing classes. It's not going so well. We're not in the same room together teaching. We share classes and it's not every other day. Oh, on A days you have them, on B days I have them. No, it was so mixed up. She would have the same class for two days then I'd have them for one and she'd have them for two and then I'd have them for two. It made absolutely no sense. It was very clear to me that this co-teaching was new to them and it just didn't make sense. Now. She spoke English, but it was very broken, and you can tell that she was taught English from a Chinese person. You could just tell. We had a very difficult time understanding each other. So trying to plan with someone it's and have certain types of conversations with someone you don't understand, and, and neither of us could understand each other, it was very difficult. Imagine lesson planning every single day just to go to school and find out either your students do not know the material that they're supposed to know or they have already covered what you have planned for that day. This would happen every single day. The bright side to this is that it kind of forced me, in order not to lose my sanity, it forced me to figure out this tip. Now this is not just a teaching in China tip. This is something that all teachers should be following. If you're not, you need to follow this right now and write it down. Don't just plan these random, not that they're random, but just these different activities every single day. Don't do that. You choose five activities or more if, you know, depending on how, how many steps are involved, you just continue to do those activities all year long. I got to avoid having to explain a new process. Some of these kids kind of knew what I was saying, but most of them had no idea and it was very stressful. So I have no doubt that Amy was getting just as frustrated as I was. So together we went to the vice principal after trying to work it out ourselves and we told him like, it's just not working. So one, he shares some truth with us and here's the truth. The truth is, is that when I first started teaching, some of the other Chinese parents whose kids I was not teaching, they saw me in the school or they heard about me being in the school and they found out that I was not teaching their child. So they pay really good money for their kids to be educated at this school. And they wanted to know why their child was being taught English from a Chinese person and not from the blonde hair, blue eyed American. Another really cool memory that I have was at this school, this international school, I wanted to collaborate with a school from New Jersey and do some type of pen pal partnership. And I did. So primary school in Delran, New Jersey, they agreed to send pen pal letters to my students. It was the coolest of the coolest of the coolest thing that I had done while I was there. So we were able to mail out two sets of letters. It takes a really long time. So if you ever do this, 
Whatever your deadline is, get it done a month before that. Millbridge, they kind of sent us this whole class video. It was really cool. In our video to Delran, I filmed all of my students individually. I had them say their name in English and they would they could introduce themselves in any way that they wanted. So they could wave, they could do a little dance. Some of them wanted to go outside for it. They wanted to be inside. It was something that they loved to talk to their parents about. Now I'm over here. Now I'm over here trying to get comfortable. I want to kind of give you the best that I can what a day in a life of teaching looks like for me from the moment I woke up to when I came home. Now because I worked for an agency, it did not always look the same, but it's pretty similar. So I would get up, not as early as I get up here. Okay, let's say I get up at seven o'clock, get ready, go outside. On some days I would hail a taxi. On days when it rained, I dreaded days when it rained. It took so long and I would literally leave an hour early because I felt like that is how long it would take me to get a taxi sometimes. The taxi takes me right to school, awesome. Then after, that school, I would hop in another taxi. Same thing, if it's still raining, takes a very long time. I would just take the taxi directly to my other school, which was pretty convenient on those days. After I would teach a class or two at my other school, I would usually have a tutoring session, which is only an hour that I would walk to. So I'd walk to the tutoring session. Other times I tutored in people's homes. Something just popped into my head and I can't believe that I was going to go without talking about lunchtime. Let's talk about lunchtime. I need to tell you my very first experience at lunch. My first day teaching at Yoshao Wan. Oh my gosh. So I go into the cafeteria. I have books in my hand because that's my mentality. Oh, it's lunchtime, but I'm still going to get some work done. Or maybe I'll be talking to other teachers and I want to take some notes. Maybe I want to point out something in the book. So I have my books. I have a Gatorade. And I walk in and I go up to this man who is serving food. So I was already intimidated. I pick up a bowl and I give it to him thinking he's going to give me rice or whatever he had back there. And he just shook his head no and he points to the soup. I was like, oh, the bowl is for soup, okay. So I give him a plate and he points to all these things and I'm just like this, I couldn't do it. I'll show you pictures. I, I can't explain right now, you know, what this stuff looked like. I mean, there was pink meat. I'm like, what is pink meat? I just, I couldn't do it the first day. So I had rice and it was just a vegetable. I, whatever I saw that was just a vegetable, he put that with my rice and then I took my soup, which had, it literally translates to a black fungus. <laughs> so it was just like broth in these pieces of black fungus. And I walk and I sit down at a table full of teachers. When I sat down, they stared at me and give me, gave me the craziest look, just bizarre look, like what is she doing? But then they just went on with their conversation. So they all have their trays with their soup and all their meat and all their this, and they are going to town on it. Nobody, nobody worries about like keeping their mouth closed when they eat or like food falling out of their mouth when they're eating with their chopsticks. Nobody seems to care except for me. And I'm just trying to get to use, I'm trying to figure out how to use these flattened metal chopsticks. I'm good at using chopsticks, but these were metal and they were flat and I, they, I, I, they were really hard. So here I am with my books and my white rice and my vegetables and my Gatorade. Nobody else had a drink. No one else had a drink. You drink your soup. That is what the soup is for to cleanse the palate. <laughs> Over time though, I'll be honest, I actually really liked the food and there were times when I, you know, was looking forward to having certain things on certain days. You have to get used to bones, you have to get used to things just not being cut perfectly for you, you get huge chunks of things that are colors that you're not used to seeing and you taste flavors of meat that you've never had before. 
but they don't taste bad and you kind of just have to not really think about what you're eating and say okay if the kids are eating it then i guess it's safe I remember one time i'm like thinking to myself what is this this is really good ended up learning months later it was literally pieces of fat i was just eating pieces of fat i have to point out that something that really disturbed me while i was teaching were some of the phrases in in their learning with english books we just called them lwe books for example, uh, characters would say to each other, you're fat, or you have fat legs, you have fat hands, you have fat blue eyes. What? <laughs> um, and there were other phrases like that too. And you actually hear this way of speaking when you're out. And I'll give you an example. I had a personal trainer, not because I, I needed to be trained or I really wanted to be trained. I did it because if you know me and my lifestyle, I really enjoy like gym and exercise and I wanted the experience. I wanted to know what it was like being at a Chinese gym with a Chinese trainer, the kind of exercises they would have me do. I wanted that experience. Well, I was trained by this guy named Mao Mao. He grabbed the fat on my arms. He didn't care. He was just all over like any fat that you could grab. He grabbed it and he goes, oh, you're fat. You're fat. You're American. You're fat. What? that's just normal to them and it makes sense because here I am teaching first and second graders that it is okay to tell someone that they're fat. We need to work on this. Okay, something about drinking coffee is just making me want to tell story after story. I don't care if this video is an hour long. I am telling them. So I had this student who called himself, his English name was Winnie. And we don't, we're not supposed to say students are bad and, and he wasn't, but compared to the rest, he had some behavioral problems, let's just say that. He just thought that he could say whatever he wanted to anyone and he was a little bit of a bully. Well, I'm in the teacher's lounge, staff room, which by the way, um, everybody sleeps in there. <laughs> I am the only one during prep who would be up working. Everyone, 100% of the teachers would be sleeping in the same room during their prep. So a teacher comes in with Winnie and he's yelling at him something in Mandarin. I don't know what he's saying. And Winnie looks scared, upset, embarrassed, ashamed, all those things. I'm like, ooh, what did this kid do? Because he doesn't usually look like that. Well, if you're a teacher in America, think about how you would handle a student who is a bully. Think about that for a second. How do you handle a student who is bullying another student? Think about that for a moment. Now here's what this teacher did. Oh my God. He got all the teacher's attention in the room, made sure that if you were napping, you're up. You know, you look at Winnie. Look at Winnie, look at him. Everybody look at him. We're all looking at him. And he just made Winnie kiss the cupboard. I don't know when Winnie ever stopped because I had to go. Winnie was just up against this. Like. <laughs> crying like bawling his eyes out and i am just sitting there like looking at everyone is this okay <laughs> this is allowed ask any chinese teacher about this and they will have a hundred of their own stories shaming them is effective do i agree with it no i don't i think it's traumatizing and I think that maybe that has something to do with why so many Chinese people commit suicide. Now, certainly there are other reasons as well, but why wouldn't it start with shaming a child who is a behavior problem at a young age? Since I'm pretty much done my coffee and the rain has stopped, I'm gonna go home and give you my top five tips if you plan on going to China to teach English. My personal top five tips that I wish somebody told me. And I don't care how old you are, I don't care what your resources are, what your language ability is, you can do it. Do not be intimidated because it is China. There are so many more resources out there now than there were or that I knew of um, when I went, which was 10 years ago. You're good and please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to set you up with people who I still know there, who I still talk to on occasion. I would love to help you. I'm back from home all caffeined up. I could honestly tell you about a hundred more stories right now. And now that I'm here, I just realized 
I never talked about. Does this child look familiar to you? Because he has been in the news quite a few times. Let me tell you a little bit about his father. You may recognize one of these stories or all of these stories. So years ago, his father was in the news. He likes to refer to himself as China's Eagle Dad for his style of what some people consider to be harsh parenting. The first time he was ever in the news was when he took Dao Dao. I've never actually called him Dao Dao before, but when he took Dao Dao to Mount Fuji, everyone said, don't do it. Don't climb Mount Fuji. You're not going to make it. He's going to climb it with me. They never made it. Now here's the funny part. They went there just so that he could hang a sign that and take a picture with a sign that says the Diaoyu Islands belong to the Chinese because, you know, the argument about the island. Well, they ended up having to be rescued by Japanese people. <laughs> so next story, right? Next story, uh, about 10 years ago when Dao Dao was three or four, he was four. He was in the news because they made a trip to New York and his father videotaped Dao Dao wearing nothing but underwear, doing push-ups in the snow. It's really sad because his son, it just, he's yelling in Chinese for a jacket. He's like, give me a jacket, give me a jacket. And his dad is just laughing at him and he's saying, do push-ups, come on, like you can get a jacket when you do these push-ups. So, and that's the type of discipline that Eagle Dad believes in. I wish that it ended there. Then when Dao Dao turned five years old, Dao Dao is the youngest, this is the youngest person to fly a plane. At five years old, his dad, he was in the plane with him, taught him to fly a plane. There's video footage of it. I am going to link all of this. Um, the video of him in New York, um, what's going, the story of him in Mount Fuji and the and Dao Dao flying this plane. I will post links in the description box. Oh yeah, he was one of my students, guys. And I did not call him Dao Dao. Uh, some of his classmates did. He wanted to be called Superman. And I had him when he was four. He was in a class with all first graders. I'm like, why is he here? I really didn't understand anything that I was doing with them, but his father has moolah. He was so sweet. And this little boy never stopped smiling. You would never think that he had this father who made him do all of these crazy things and yelled at him and this and that. No, like you would never think that. And I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with his father's ideas of parenting. I'm just telling you that this was one happy kid. All right, are you ready for my top five tips? Because I have to go cook dinner. Tip one. Know what your intentions are going there. Your intentions might be to save a lot of money. Your intentions might be to travel. You're there, you wanna work so that you can afford to stay there, but you want to travel. Or just know what your intentions are because that should help you figure out whether or not you want to work for an agency or just get right in with a public school. If you're looking for that moolah, if you're looking for that money, don't go through an agency. Why are you going to pay a middle man? Tip two, tip two, tip two, tip two, tip two, tip two. Tip number two, join some kind of a group. Join a group before you get there and while you're there and join more than one group, okay? Don't just rely on the school or your agency to answer your questions, they're great but ask the locals, okay? And maybe you find a group of people doing exactly what you do or living where you live. The possibilities are endless with the questions, okay? Make a friend before you even get there. Um, income, okay? The cost of noodles in Shanghai is not the same as the cost of noodles in Beijing. Tip three, hey, tip three, tip three. Tip number three, okay. Tip number, <laughs> tip number three, when you are choosing an apartment, choose one at the highest level the highest level for multiple reasons, okay? One, noise, chaos, people. It is an overpopulated place and people are everywhere. And if you're anything like me, sometimes you just really need quiet. The higher you go, the more quiet you have. And hey, the view is better. So go for that reason. More importantly, the roaches. The higher you are, the less roaches there are. Do I need to say any more? I have become a bit of a roach expert, okay? <sighs> what else? 
Now I never live in any high end apartments, so there are no elevators. I have never been to an apartment where there's an elevator. So if you're at the highest floor, imagine all those steps you're taking every day. Where am I going with this? Less cellulite, okay? Le Goodbye cellulite, go to the sixth floor. Tip number four, I really wish somebody would have told me, you can negotiate anything. Here in America, you know, you have a contract, you sign a contract, there's not a whole lot of negotiating you can do once that contract is signed. It is not the same in China. I did not learn this for quite some time and I learned through other people, through conversations with other people. I just feel that anything can be negotiated. I would have talked to my supervisors about just all kinds of things and when it came time to um, looking into apartments and all of that and, and what I was being shown and what I was being offered in terms of reimbursement and when I realized how much I was valued I would have negotiated so much I can't even say harder I didn't negotiate anything I thought that what they said was what had to be my fifth tip for you which I definitely saved the best for last because I just think this is the best tip make friends with as many Chinese people as you can now how is this a tip like you should just do that well, in my experience, it was so easy to get sucked into expat life. You meet so many expats, um, so many people who are speaking English, who want to take you out, who want to go out with you and, and, and give you all the information and tell you all about China. And that is great. They are wonderful, but it is not the same as building relationships with Chinese people. And this doesn't mean you have to hang out with them every day. But instead of being busy or hanging out with your expat friends, when someone's parent wants to invite you over for dinner, you say yes and you go. If somebody wants to take you out the co for coffee, don't be too busy for that, go. Even if you have a hard time understanding them. If you're sitting at a little temple and an old man comes over to you and wants to practice his English on you, talk to him, listen, practice with him. It is these relationships that have impacted me the most, that have taught me the most about Chinese culture. Thank you so much for watching. I know this video was a bit of a longer one compared to my other videos. I just really enjoy telling stories about what it, what it was like teaching in China. If you are on the fence about whether or not you wanna teach, I hope this gives you the push that you need to just do it. Just do it, you won't regret it. Reach out to me again if you have any questions about anything. And that's it. Please like, subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Maybe I'll make another one like this one. I have so much more that I could talk about the culture, what it was like living there, what it was like apartment hunting, all of that. So if you want to see more, just let me know. And that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.